Okay, we have a panel now. That's very exciting too. And we will talk about NFTs and how to use them without getting in prison, because that's not so easy. How to buy and sell NFTs without breaking the law. And I will give the microphone to Florian to do this. Yes, Florian. And you take your audience with you. Hello, welcome, welcome. <laughs> Alrighty, anyone can hear me? Sounds good. Okay, then um, let's get right to it. GM friends, uh, we are the legal panel here. That might sound a little boring, but we try to make it not boring. Our intention is to bring to be the fun in funeral, so it won't be boring. Um, what's on the game plan today? Um, first of all, we I will introduce my fellow panelists and also will introduce myself in a short second. Then we want to start in a progressive and disruptive way and don't want to have our main messages at the end of the presentation where we have to rush. So we will basically start with our main messages. And afterwards, we will talk a little bit about, bit about licensing, dive a little bit into the tax part, and then um, Alex will talk, give some first-hand insights into how politics works nowadays and how we can get new regulation if we need new regulation and stuff like that. Okay, so I haven't introduced myself yet. My name is Florian Savotsky. I'm a tax advisor with EY in Berlin, Germany. So I'll be mostly speaking for the tax part. Um, next to me is Daoud Sulfakar. Um, he is uh, a, a a startup founder, also based in Berlin, in various associations, uh, and will mainly focus on the licensing part. Um, further apart is Alex, uh, Alexander Kulitz. He's a former member of the German parliament, um, also a lawyer, now working in a family business or in the board of a family business. Um, also, like, um, interesting insights. And on my far right um, uh, is Oliver Scherenberg, a lawyer, uh, mainly focusing on uh, IP and stuff. This was what he will mainly be talking about. Uh, also started the, the Web3 Lex thing, which is a really interesting project where I had the honor also to participate in, but I'm sure he can uh, talk about that more. Um, that will be uh, everything for the introduction because uh, we will be at the party tomorrow. Uh, Oliver is doing pizza, so you can also talk to him, so you can always talk to us. Um, so if you really want to get to know us, uh, feel free to approach us anytime. We are also at all uh, social uh, media, so there, is an, there are easy ways to approach us. Okay, then next point on the agenda will be our main messages. Main messages. Um, Oli, why don't you start? What is your main message? What should people keep in mind after our presentation? What's that? Yes, so hi everyone. Thank you for having me. It's, it's a pleasure being here today. Uh, let me briefly introduce myself. Um, I'm Oliver. I'm an attorney um, based out of Hamburg in Germany. Uh, the focus of my attention in the Web3 space is licensing, monetization of intellectual property assets, uh, which brought me into the space uh, just about a year ago or so when clients started having questions how to, well, how, how to deal with uh, commercial rights, especially in NFT projects, uh, on platforms and so on. So my, my main message here today for you is um, if you are dealing with NFTs, if you are active in the Web3 space, be mindful of some of the legal gaps because I'm afraid there is no, uh, well, no space without law. Not even the metaverse is a place where you can accept uh, moving around without uh, some legal obstacles, especially when it comes to the commercial rights of your NF NFT projects. This is something to take into consideration. We'll hear about uh, that, how you can deal with that from a practical and technical side, probably from Dodd. Um, fr from my side, just be mindful as a project owner and as a consumer as well, just to make sure you're not stepping into traps. Okay, Alex, do you want to continue? Yes, well, uh, my key message for today, it's actually quite easy to moan about all the regulation that is going on, but I think one thing that is very necessary to understand is politicians and people who actually make these regulations usually are not professionals. They're not into details into all the things that are happening. So my key message is to the community, guys, if you want the regulation to fit actually what you're looking for, you have to approach the politicians, you have to tell them what you're looking for, and you have to 
interact with them. Otherwise, you will have regulation that you cannot work on. And the, this is going to be my key message today. Without working with politicians, you will have regulation that you cannot work with. Okay. Oh. Hi, I'm Doubt. I'm the founder of License Rocks. As the name of our company sounds, like we think that licensing is super important for that space. And what you should take out of this uh, little panel here is we have a politician, we have a lawyer here, we have a tax expert, we have someone from the tax side. You have to talk with various parties if you're thinking about building up an NFT project in a legally way. And we have all these parties here tonight. So uh, just keep on talking, collaborating before you start your own NFT project. Sounds good. L let me finish that part as well. I will basically continue what Oliver said. But from in my tax world, everything is somehow based to numbers instead of the law world where, yeah, you don't always end up with numbers. But my main message will be in the tax world, um, we have a lot of uncertainty, legal uncertainty, as we have in all legal fields. And it is easy as individuals or as businesses to use that uncertainty to avoid tax payments. Um, because most tax advisors don't know what to do. Um, but I think um, one should not be doing that because um, if you really start at the beginning to get your tax game plan right, um, it will help you in the end uh, because sooner or later the financial authorities will get the better grip of what is happening. They will approach you and you also just have a better feeling if you have all your taxes in check, made up your mind at the beginning and really can be on offense uh, when it comes to what did you do the last years? Did you take really duly care of, of, your, tax, uh, of your taxes? And you can uh, be in the affirmative on that and can say, well, uh, I did my taxes correctly. Uh, I didn't dodge anything and um, I did a proper documentation. So far, so good. So th th these are our main messages. If they caught your interest, uh, then feel free to stay. Uh, if not, uh, be advised that the free beer will be from 5 p.m. on, so you can might as well also stay here. Um, okay, so now let's move to the, uh, to the licensing part. Um, I would, again, Oliver, probably start with you. Um, I have no issues admitting that licensing is nothing for me. I do my tax stuff. Uh, I have no clue about it. But if, yeah, if a company would approach me uh, and hopefully said, well, you did a good job at the tax part, but um, somehow I, I have to, I have worries about licensing. What do I have to keep in mind as a company who wants to issue NFTs? Yes. So the first thing I would address, since this is my, my area of law, is the question what do you want the community to do with that NFT? So do you want to have any purpose attached to it? Do you want them to monetize it in a way that they can create derivative works, for example, have their own NFT collection based on that original NFT, print it on t-shirts and sell those, have animated TV series or burger shops or whatever you can think of. So the, the purpose, what you want to achieve with your NFT will define the scope of rights you want to grant um, together with that token and with that JPEG. So the fundamental thing to understand is that there are three different layers when you have an, an NFT. I'm, I now refer to, some, to something like a, an art project, so a profile picture project, for example. So first of all, you have the token, which is the stuff that is like uh, scribbled into the, through the blockchain. That is the, the piece that identifies uh, the ownership of something else, which is the second layer, and that's the digital asset behind it. For example, a JPEG. And there's the third layer, which defines the right that you have for the second layer, for the JPEG. So if you, if you understand that these are three different things, you can understand that you can basically slice whatever right you want to grant to your consumer and to your NFT owner by making clear in the terms and conditions typically or in the communication of your project what you want to do. i just give you an example. So if you want your, um, your project to be simply an access token for your community, which means your NFT is connected with your wallet to a gated community, you do not need to give uh, your users and your owners commercial rights. On the other hand, if you have a project where the main identifier is that people can go out and monetize and use the NFT for their own commercial purposes as brands or because they want to identify themselves with it. They, they use it as an avatar or even as a testimonial for their brand. 
then you certainly want to provide them with as many rights that they can have, especially to use that in a commercial um, environment. So this is the purpose that defines the scope, and you can do everything from keeping the right entirely as an NFT project, just giving the right for personal use. You can give non-exclusive licenses to the owners of the NFT, and you can give um, exclusive rights, or in some jurisdictions, even transfer the entire IP. Um, this is something you have to define beforehand, and then it will be part of that project. So this means that every owner of that NFT should, that's the question if it works, but that's, that's the idea, should enjoy exactly these rights. And, and that is something I will, I will want to pass on to Dodd, the question is just how can I make that transparent? Because, for example, if you go in OpenSea and you check a project, you will not be able to find out which commercial rights are attached to that project. So you will have to go actually and Google the, the project website, typically, at least in most of the projects, to find the terms. They're typically not on chain, they're not attached to the NFT, but they're somewhere in Web2, if you so want. That's something that is a concern, but that's uh, the, the first part I would, I would try to discuss with the clients. Making it visible is something that Dodd can tell you more about. Um, what, what we think, like if you think about licensing and if you think about license contracts, I always say if you have problems to sleep, take a license contract and start reading uh, because it's boring. Sorry for that, but it's, it's like in that legal language and most people, even if they find a license contract, uh, they might have to go to an attorney to understand it to figure out what kind of rights they have. <laughs> and we are now in a digital age. Um, awesome. We have new technologies and we need a new concept how licensing works. And for me, uh, we, we did a lot of research. We looked at a lot of different industries and looked what kind of license metrics are in these uh, license agreements that really matter for the end user. And we figured out they're always between five to max 20 metrics that really matter to anyone. So why not visualize them? So you see with one glance, what are you allowed to do? And why not attach that, as uh, Oliver pointed out, to the NFT and not have like another layer, but put it on chain and connect it to the NFT. That's what we are doing at License Rocks. And uh, we're, we, we have like tons of um, drawers uh, because we have been in the space since 2017 with different solutions, but right now is the timing, I think, uh, for licensing. And I think it was that Moonbird uh, case where Oliver can probably say something to it, which kind of uh, shaked up that industry and showed everyone why IP rights are so important. If, if I may. Um, so, yes. yeah, indeed, the, the Moonbirds case, maybe some of you uh, experienced that also, maybe as a holder of the Moonbirds. So, the Moonbirds project um, was a famous NFT project that's very successful, where the, the floor price uh, was, was raising, um, uh, rising pretty, pretty highly. Um, and the interesting thing is, when the project started, the project owners, they said, even before minting, you will get the full IP rights, so you will get the full intellectual property rights, together with your digital asset, which means you're not only the owner of the asset, but also of that third layer that I explained before, you're, you're getting the full IP rights. Now, in the terms and conditions, that was not the case. The terms and conditions always said you will get a license to use these moonbirds, the pictures, and then something interesting happened a couple of weeks uh, in the project, that the project owner declared that the entire intellectual property is in fact abandoned. So they put the entire project under Creative Commons, under Creative Commons Zero, which is in fact uh, meaning that everyone can now freely use um, the pictures that are underlying. So the, the second layer is now accessible to everyone because the third layer of my description before is now basically gone. Now you have a strange situation that after the minting, the project owner changed the terms, making it maybe less valuable for the owner of the NFT to have that NFT. And, and that is something that is, it is weird. Um, and this lack of transparency was what actually caused this discussion to really to, to go into wild directions because people were not aware what they had. There were all sorts of misconceptions in the field where people thought, but I own the IP. Yeah, but I have an exclusive license. 
And unfortunately, few people bother to read the terms and conditions, which, have to which would have told them that you have a non-exclusive license, and that is exactly what you still have, even if the project is under Creative Commons Zero, because you still have the same thing that you had before. It's a non-exclusive right to use that. Now everyone else has the right. It's a commercial decline, maybe, but it's no change in the rights. And they were quite expensive, right? Mm -hmm. if, you, if you're bored into them for, I don't know, 20 or something like that, to uh, exploit the IP and all of a sudden they change it, that would be weird, yeah? But now, if I think about, if I, as a Moonbird owner, would go now to court and discuss with an attorney that something was changed, uh, the attorney is going to ask me, what did you buy into? Yeah. Uh, and then I have to explain him, well, I bought an NFT, and then he will ask me, well, what can you show to prove? And then I will show him the transaction but he will probably say something is missing there, and what would that be? Yeah, I think that the, if it depends, as very often the first answer if you ask an attorney, it depends. So it depends on who, you, um, who is your client. Uh, if my client was Moonbirds, I would say, um, well, you, you still have what you wanted. You wanted a non-exclusive license. I never promised you a commercial success. I even excluded liability in my terms and conditions. So what do you want? This is crypto space. You buy something, you don't know what it is, if you can use it. If you have the expectation that you have exclusive monetization rights and that is a disappointment for you, then I'm sorry, but that's not my problem. On the other hand, if I was the attorney of, um, uh, of, of, of the owner of the NFT, I would say, well, yeah, that may be true that you have not promised anything, but at the same time, your project website said, I should own the IP. You were always talking of us commercializing these assets. And now I was in negotiations with someone paying me a lot of money for a license to use my JPEG. And all of a sudden, this is simply not worth any more, any money, because everyone else can do it for free. So this license negotiation is gone and my monetization effort is broken. And therefore, I will want to have some damage uh, from you. So it really depends which side. I think you have good arguments for both. But one of the key messages is, if there is no transparency, you will always have discussions. And therefore, it is, it is really a vital part of NFT transactions to know what you're buying, not only property. This can be solved with a token. So the digitalization of, of an asset and making it a unique piece, that is what the NFT solves. That's what the token solves. But it's not solved in, in regard of the intellectual property rights that are underlying. Okay. So if I get your debate correctly, and correct me if I'm wrong, I would summarize it, that you are rooting for standardization of license terms. That kind of reminds me what, is, what happened in, I don't know, a few decades ago in international commerce, where we have INCO terms. If you contract with someone in Asia who you probably don't understand, he writes on the package X words, mm -hmm. and I immediately know, okay, who has to take care of customs, who is it insured, who has to pick it up, and stuff like that. So I would basically understand you guys that you're rooting for standardization. If I go to OpenSea, I do not only see my token and I do not only see the, the web page description of what I'm buying. Is it maybe a claim for a shoe or is it beer like over here? Uh, it is also basically stating you get commercial rights A, B or you don't get it or whatever. Yes, that would be very helpful. And indeed standardization is exactly there for making it more visible for everyone and to have an easier access. There are ideas of standardizing things with standard terms and conditions, standard licensing terms, Creative Commons, or even um, Anderson Horowitz provided some templates. There are other initiatives as well. Um, but as long as we do not have that, it is still an individual thing that attorneys can determine with the client, and it will be different. And if it's not even visible, for example, in OpenSea, because there is no button where it says which commercial rights or it doesn't show that. Not yet, maybe. Yeah, and even if there would be a button uh, out of a legal term, do they have to give consent that they agree to something uh, so to make it compliant or not? Well, uh, I mean, just imagine OpenSea trying to read that from the terms and conditions, condensing that message and putting it on their platform. They would never do that. That's a huge liability risk. Yep. So it needs to be something that can be automatically read out of the smart contract, for example, 
or in some other way really displayed together with the NFT that it automatically comes up. So it would have to be something that is predetermined and that is automatically read out through the platform so it will be displayed in a, in a unique way and in, in a uniform way through all platforms. There's just one more thing uh, you need to state maybe to the audience because there's a misconception about smart contracts, which are two things not, and that's your turn. Yeah, okay, okay. Well, smart, maybe, yes. Yeah, so smart contracts, I, I would assume that most of you know smart contracts are neither smart nor contracts. That's at least what we say. I think they're actually relatively smart. But in, in the true sense of an agreement, they're not legal terms, but they're code. So they're actually self-executing commands, if you so want, but they're not the contractual language, which means typically the license terms that you have are not even part of the smart contract, but they are on the website of a program. So you will have to Google that. They can change that every time. It's exactly the opposite of what you want to achieve with a Web3 uh, decentralized um, and, and untampered uh, solution. So that is, most of the projects have it like that right now. Uh, the license terms could even be changed. And as we saw in the Moonbird case, there even are changed uh, every once in a while. Um, and that shouldn't happen. So this is something where we already know we have some solutions. Uh, as, as I said, and Dowd is one of the experts, we already have solutions where you can, you can mint an NFT together with the license term. You bake it into that or you have it as part of the protocol. Um, but most of the existing blue chip projects don't have it like that right now. That is some cool stuff. And once you get that uh, additional layer for these terms, hit me up. I also add some text parts that would mm -hmm. also be pretty helpful for us in the text world. But before we move to the text world, uh, I want to ask a, like, an like a question concerning individuals and just make up that case. S sticking with the Moonbird example, just imagine you had a Moonbird and you sold it somehow commercially. You made contracts and whatever. Um, can you claim something now? If, can you repeat the question? I'm not like, sure I understand. Like, Sorry. Because like, I'm asking this question because uh, it, for us in the tech world, it's often a problem if you sell a product and what you sold changes afterwards. Yes. If, you get a, if you give out an NFT, no one knows at the beginning. And then after a few months, somebody's, the issuer says, well, you get a shoe for it, you get a hoodie, or you can get beer or whatever. Yes. Uh, and now from a personal perspective, if someone held that Moonbird, did something commercially with it, but mm. now these terms changed. Uh, is there any recommendations for these people or? Let's say, um, I, I'm afraid again, it depends on who you, um, who you represent. Um, like in, in my position, if I were a Moonbird holder, which I'm not, I would probably say, well, I'm, I'm really upset about the situation that I have, I think I have a commercial loss. And as I said before, um, Probably if I read the terms and conditions one more time, I have to assume that it was my own mistake that I relied on something that was not promised to me. Um, but still, I would assume that there is a certain responsibility of a project owner to, to at least keep some sort of promise or to at least ask the community if they are okay in giving up the IP for a project because it's a fundamental change um, in the philosophy or in, let's say, in this, in this little space of the community. Um, and, and I would be very upset. So I would indeed say this may be something that I assumed was part of it. And it's like a, uh, if you buy a car and it's not working, I say, no, I bought this NFT and it's not working in the way I, I wanted it to work. Yeah. Therefore, I would, yeah, I, I would be reluctant in this particular case. But indeed, if the project terms change fundamentally, I would say that's not what I purchased. You cannot change that. Um, so I will have a right of remedy. Okay. Okay. Now, slightly moving into the text direction, that would, what, what do you perceive in the text world? Does it stop people from engaging in that Web3 world? Or like, do people, yeah, basically say, well, yeah, we have legal uncertainty, but that goes in my favor. So I don't really care that there's uh, uncertainty. And yeah, probably also authorities won't notice what I do with my wallets. They probably won't even understand what a wallet is. So I'm cool with taxes, or what is your perception? Um, how companies, how do you yourself personally see the tax world? Uh, well, that's a good question because uh, sometimes we get, let's say a VC approaches us and he says, do you have to pay VET on, on an NFT? Uh, 
I can't really point them to something where I say, yeah, it's written here and it's like that because of that. And I would always recommend to go to a tax expert, but I have someone sitting right next to me who could probably answer that question. Okay, so you're really going right to it. Yeah, so uh, from the tax perspective, uh, like uh, we could ha have a whole lecture about it, but I actually don't want to uh, bore you out with that. Uh, things I can tell you for the tax world is, as my main message was, um, if you especially dealing with like, say you bought a Bart Ape, this is, these are highly valuable intangibles or assets, however you want to call them. So it should be a natural feeling that that somehow should be connected to, to taxes, that somehow you speak to your tax advisor and maybe you should tell them, well, uh, I spent a lot of money and I sold it and I got even more money, should we do something about it? Um, what is up on the horizon is that um, information exchange is now, is, an, is now a big thing in the taxation world. We see that now in the Web2 world. So obviously the tax world is lacking behind, but uh, we have that now from next year on for the Web2 world. So if you sell something over eBay or if you are an Uber driver or if you use Airbnb, these incomes you you generate by doing these activities are reported to the tax authorities. Um, this is what is happening now, but in a few years, this will also come for crypto exchanges. You name them Kraken, Bitcoin, uh, Coinbase, wherever. If you exchange fiat money um, to crypto or vice versa, that will be reported to the financial authorities and they will ask questions. And I think that does not work in favor of anyone who wants to dodge his taxes because everything is on the blockchain. Everything will still be, even though in a decade, it will be readable for the financial authorities. And trust me, they're actually not bad at it. Um, they're still, they, they have to scale up their, their capacities of, of auditing what is happening in the Web3 world. But there are smart minds in our Ministry of Finance um, and I think I can say that there are smarter minds in our Ministry of Finance than in most other Ministry of Finances over the world. Because what I see from the tax world that is often ministries don't understand what is happening there and basically say, well, NFTs must be digital assets, tax it, we take the money. We don't have fully understood it, but we take it. And our uh, also legislation is not taking that approach. They are thinking it through and uh, I'm quite wouldn't say proud, but I think they are doing a good job on what is happening. You also mentioned, uh, so to sum that up, for, for, the, for individual persons, uh, not a good idea to dodge taxes. Do your documentation, use some tools. I don't want to um, be, uh, be a commercial for the tools, but I think you all know them. There are not that many. Um, we also use them if clients approach us because no one can use an Excel sheet for 200,000 transactions but use that and just a short glimpse on, um, on businesses. VAT is a problem. And to sum that up, um, usually in the VAT world, we know what is sold. It's either a supply or it's a service and we have different kinds of services, but usually also the supplier tells you what he intends to uh, sell. But if you just think of the, the big projects, I can't even now ca characterize what the Board Egg Yacht Club is. Is it art? Is it for the parties? Is it what will come in the future? So that is a big thing. So if you're a business, think about VAT. You should talk to a tax advisor to sum that tax part up. And I think now we've uh, we talked about licensing. We talked about tax, um, especially you guys and licensing. From what I understood, you had pretty precise uh, thoughts on what should be done, maybe by OpenSea or maybe also by the regulators. So Alex, um, you as a former member of our parliament, why don't you give us like some insights how that works, how new policy is done, not just from the formal level that it goes to the Bundestag and the Bundesrat, but if we were now here to say we need that regulation as the other two guys proposed, what would be the way to do it? How do we uh, get people to, to do that, basically. Well, thanks, Florian. I think, first of all, we really have to understand that most people, politicians as well as the administration when it comes to tax authorities, etc., they're not familiar with these kind of technologies. They're not familiar with what is going on. So for them, it's very difficult to tackle it, either the legal side 
by making laws, the policy making. Why? How am I supposed to make any policies if I don't understand the technology? And that's one of the key issues. So what is happening in reality? In reality, we have some experts in the ministries, um, also at the, at, the VM, uh, at the finance ministry. Those experts, they will know, and they are the key holders. And that's a little bit the problem, because you might only have one, two, or three people who actually understand it. And they can almost dictate anything they want to up to the ministry level, up to the people. Then afterwards, usually, laws are being made by the ministries, and then they are passed on to the parliament, and the parliament will accept them or not. Now, politicians will only have a look at, will I get elected on it, or won't I get elected? Will I be favorable or not? Now, this is a very special topic, because most citizens in Germany are still not concerned about NFTs, crypto, blockchain, whatever. Most people, they have completely different issues, so most politicians will just say, if there's an advice for my party to accept it, I'll accept it. If there's a disadvice, I'll, I, I won't accept it. Now, one of the problems is, of course, all these new disruptive technologies have a lot of enemies, old economy, etc. So they will try to lobby or infiltrate polit politics to also tell them, just don't accept this. Just make sure that you regulate it in a way that, I don't know, the, the old assets or the old, old analog world will still sustain. And that leads to the part where a politician at some point, he doesn't know about the technology, he'll just accept whatever's on his floor, on the table. And that leads to some legislation, which for many very progressive young people who are open for technology change, etc., it makes it very difficult and hard to deal with those things. And I think this is one thing we really have to understand. I'm also quite happy that our Ministry of Finance kind of is trying to stay open and understand what's going on. And there has been an advice by the Minister of Finance to all the tax authorities to at least, um, well, it's quite a paper, but it's worth reading because they try to really do it in an easy way to explain what the technology is about. But let's be very honest, politics is a very complicated thing. We're talking about the federal system, we're talking about different layers, Europe, uh, the federal government, the, the lender, the states, and that's only in Germany. Now you have to consider that in all the other countries too. And that's when we talk about Mika and all the legislation that comes from Europe that we have to adapt. That's when it becomes very tricky. So what do we expect from our policymakers? That's the key point. I think what we have to do as a co internet community, as a blockchain community or in general, we have to address the members of parliament that it's not, it is serious. And we are also considering electing people who understand it and who don't because otherwise, um, policymakers and politicians will not really engage with the technologies and with the policy making. Let me just very quickly, because I think we have a few more minutes left, Florian, give a quick anecdote, which I think was rather funny. So I remember that was just before COVID. Um, I think though you're also in the Blockchain Association, right? Yeah. Blockchain Association had a breakfast for parliamentarians to explain them what blockchain really is. And uh, you know the average age in parliament, so I don't have to tell you how old most of the people were who joined this breakfast. The fun fact was most of every MP, M every member of parliament was more or less interested in a new technology because the media writes about it, young people earn a lot of money. A lot of things are happening, and we want to understand what it is. So we had this breakfast. There was a 24-year-old guy explaining to all these, um, I would say, senior members of parliament, 50-plus, what blockchain is. I think it took like three minutes or four minutes and you really saw the question mark in everybody's face <laughs> because MPs just didn't understand it. So they took out their cell phones, did some other stuff, whatever. After breakfast was done, half an hour, they went for their daily work. I asked some of them afterwards, so what did you think? Did you understand it? Did you get it? Like most of my colleagues, they just said, I think this is some really nerdy stuff. Let's not do that. Let's just stick to what we know. Let's just do what we uh, continue, what we did, what we always did. And that's exactly the danger. If we want to keep up in Germany, if we want to keep up on the technological level, and if, if we want to go into the digital age, there's no way that we continue the way we did. And sometimes we do have to rethink all the pieces of legislation because honestly, Oliver already stated it. One of the main issues is all the, leg all the laws that we have are more or less from the analog age. And we just take them over and try to amend them in a digital way. Sometimes it doesn't work. Sometimes we just need to rethink completely how we want to engage in a digital world. So we need new laws and we need to coordinate them globally. And NFT doesn't stop at the border to Austria. So we need to coordinate these things globally. And that's a huge challenge, almost impossible politically to manage this challenge, but that's what we're here for. And that's, I think, what we have to tackle as a generation. Interesting insight. Thank you, Alex. Um, so what I also can 
feedback from, from the text world that from what I see, because what I usually do at work is basically see how new juris, uh, legislation is done from old laws in the straight text world, there's not much dialogue. But what I can see now, there, there are round tables by especially your party where dialogue is really uh, fostered. So that is a good thing. Uh, what can you guys add from your more legal non-number part? Is there also a dialogue with the legislature? Are there possibilities? Yeah, yes, I think it is very important and even it is fundamental that we all understand this is not a German thing. So even as an attorney, you're typically focused on your legislation, on your national law. That's not going to work. It hasn't worked in the internet ages either. A little bit better because you at least had some national attachment points like servers or, or people that are, that are uh, mentioned in the legal notice or something like that. That simply doesn't work on the blockchain. So it is fundamental to understand there are no borders, so it will be more difficult to find attachment points. You have to, um, you have to address also matters under different national laws. So you have to be in an exchange with attorneys and experts from other jurisdictions. You need to understand that IP matters are dealt in a different way in Germany than in the US, for example. Regulatory issues in Dubai are different than in Spain, or property laws are different in France than in, uh, than in Brazil, for example. And if you understand that, the next consequence must be that you connect with people, you build networks, you try to connect with folks that are on the same eye level in, this, in other industries, and that will lead to exchanges that make you more educated and that will allow you to address legislators if you want, or everyone just behaves in a positive way, and we try to even avoid legislation for as long as we can. Just once the rugs get pulled, we need to make sure that people are protected. I don't think we have to reinvent everything and over-regulate. I just think we need protection where it is important. And we need to understand the things uh, cross-border as well. That, I think, sorry, but our time is about to end. I think, but it is a good last word. I think uh, it's about networking here, but also in the whole Web3 community. I think we are a pretty cool community. Uh, and that, that should be, shall be my last words. Uh, feel free to approach us at the beer here at the party tonight uh, it's ju not just what Alex said not just connecting with the politicians also connecting in between our con community I think that's about it thank you for attending our panel and have fun at the conference here I hope to see you guys soon thank you guys thank you.